Uh, welcome everybody to our opening seminar of the winter seminar series for Midas. Um, and today uh, we are just absolutely delighted to have Timnit Gebru with us. Um, she is a computer scientist, the founder of Black in AI, um, until recently co-lead of the ethical AI research team at Google Brain, um, and somebody who's done a number of really, really interesting and cool things over the past few years. Um, I, I personally have uh, really appreciated um, reading about her work on model cards and data sheets, uh, which she was doing about the same time that I was doing stuff on nutrition labels for data sets. Um, today's talk though is on computer vision um, and uh, some of the consequences of it. And today's talk is also co-sponsored by the AI lab at the University of Michigan, the Center for Ethics, Society and Computing, and the IT dissonance series. Um, I also want to plug if you're a grad student and you're interested in topics of ethics and society, the Center for Ethics, Society and Computing is uh, accepting affiliates uh, from graduate students. So please consider applying. Um, next week, um, we have uh, our own Arya Farahi uh, uh, giving the Midas seminar, uh, followed by Misty Hagenis from the US Census Bureau on February 8th, and Mona Diab from George Washington University on Feb 15th. Um, so uh, hope to see you all uh, in future weeks. Uh, finally, I wanna thank uh, various sponsors and affiliates, Quicken Loans, AMS, Wacker, General Dynamics, uh, the EPA. Um, and with that, I'd like to welcome Tim again and turn it over to her. Um, okay, you might hear some of my dogs around here just um, as I'm going um, through this. Um, so thanks for having me. And uh, um, so I, I um, I actually, I, I gave a, a lecture um, very recently in Justin's um, computer version class. So this is gonna be a, a similar lecture to that one. And it's a, just a general sort of overview about computer vision and, and, and how it's um, affecting people. So this was part of a three-part tutorial that my, well, my former colleague at Google, Emily Denton and I um, gave. And, uh, if you have any questions, let me see if I can t look at the, um, let me, uh, yeah, okay. So I, I'm gonna try to see if I can see the Q and A as I'm talking. So if you have questions, I'll try to, and if they relate to a specific yeah. section, Tim, I'll- Tim, let me, uh, if if you want me to, I'm happy to handle that. And okay. and I'll, I'll interrupt you if, if need be. Otherwise keep, don't worry about your flow. Okay, cool, okay. Um, so I wanted to start uh, by um, discussing this um, set of questions that we had asked students in a um, in a, a graduate school computer vision class, and this was spurred by the fact that neither Emily nor I really had any understanding of what computer vision was being used in general, where most of the money was going for, et cetera. And so we want, we were curious to see if other students who are interested in this um, area, because the class, this was a Stanford class that many of us had taught or TA'd, um, had grown in size, but we, it was a computer vision class, but we didn't have an understanding if people who are super interested in the class actually knew what the um, technology was being used for. So, so the question is, where do you think this technology is being used for today? And I think we're, we're planning on asking a similar survey to participants at CVPR, um, the Computer Vision Pattern Recognition Conference, just to see um, if people have any understanding. And um, a lot of people were saying, you know, personal convenience, for example, sorting photos, like for instance, you can go through your photos and find the ones that where you're smiling, um, healthcare, like automated melanoma detection, self-driving cars, et cetera. 
Then we asked, you know, where do you think the greatest positive potential is? I think the questions are a bit confusing. Like where this means, you know, where do you think it can it can do the best, the most good kind of thing? Um, and I think a lot of people said healthcare, um, I guess, and also self-driving cars, assistive technologies. And then where do you think the greatest negative potential of computer vision technology lies? And for some reason, the um, the legend is missing here, but I think most of it said um, this is policing and military applications. Um, and not I can't tell if this is healthcare or self self driving cars. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to ask this question was to to also make the point that people's understanding of current reality and how the world is right now affects how they think technology um, will, will change the environment in the future. And this was actually very relevant. <laughs> this was actually, um, I saw this in my most recent incident at Google where a number of people wanted me to, to retract a paper because it didn't, well, it seems to me that their view of what the potential risks were that we were discussing was very different from ours because we had different standpoints. And so I think in social science, people talk about standpoint theory. So here's an example. Um, this is a, an excerpt from James Landay's um, Smart Interfaces for Human-Centered AI. Um, so James Landay is an HCI professor at Stanford. So he wrote, imagine for a second that you are in an office hard at work Everybody can see this, right? You can you can see my screen, I hope. There was at some point where I went on and on with, <laughs> without people being able to see my screen. So, okay, imagine for a moment that you're in an office hard at work, but it's no ordinary office. By observing cues like your posture, tone of voice, and breathing patterns, it can sense your mood and tailor the lighting and sound accordingly. Through gradual ambient shifts, the space around you can take the edge off when you're stressed or boost your creativity when you hit a lull. Imagine further that you are a designer using tools with equally perceptive abilities. At each step in the process, they riff on, on your ideas based on their knowledge of your own creative persona, contrasted with features from the best work of others. So imagine this environment. This environment is an environment where it's basically catering to you, right? All of the sensors, all of the devices, everything in your environment is trying to make you feel better. So you're the boss, you're the one controlling your environment. So here is a different kind of understanding of this exact same environment. Um, and this is from Ali Al-Khatib. Um, and so he says, someday you may have to work in an office where the lights are carefully programmed and tested by your employer to hack your body's natural production of melatonin through the use of blue light, eking out every drop of energy you have while you're on the clock leaving you physically and emotionally drained when you leave work. Your eye movements may someday come under the scrutiny of algorithms unknown to you that classifies you on dimensions such as narcissism and psychopathy, determining your career and indeed your life prospects. This is a completely different understanding of what kind of future uh, you will have, even though the, the devices and the ambient sensors and everything have not changed. But what's different about this is the two people, the standpoint of the two people who, um, wow, it says 1K participants. There's 1,000 people here. Sorry, I got distracted. There's a lot of people. Thanks for attending. So what's different is the two people who are saying these things, right? So Ali Al-Khatib is an Iraqi American. Um, he, he knows what persecution means. I know him. He's dealt with a lot of persecution in his life. So he's not used to his environment catering to him. Um, and James Londy, who's a great professor in computer science and HDI, has not had to deal with the same level of persecution that Ali has had. So even when given one place with the same exact technology, their view of how this technology would affect society in the future is completely different. So when we look at what Ali's saying, you know, someday, you may come under the scrutiny of algorithms unknown to you that classifies you on dimensions such as narcissism and psychopathy. There's a number of those. Um, I had signed actually a letter against one in 2018 called the Extreme Betting Initiative that was not based on computer vision, but it was based on analyzing people's social media um, posts. And they were supposed to use 
um, this analysis to determine whether certain refugees should be allowed to the country or certain immigrants should be allowed to the country or not. But in terms of computer vision, um, here are some examples. There's a startup called Faceception. Here's one example that purports to have a model that can just look at someone's face and uh, determine whether this person has a high IQ or not, whether this person is more likely to be a terrorist or not, whether this person is uh, more likely to be a white collar offender or not. Now, this is kind of based on debunked science, right? They used to have physiognomy, uh, you know, in the 19th century where they analyzed people's skulls and the distance between their eyes and all that to try to figure out how much of a criminal they were, et cetera. And so uh, my former colleague, Meg Mitchell, has written a really comprehensive blog post ca called uh, Physiognomy's New Clothes that talks about recent, the recent resurgence of this, um, the, this pseudoscience uh, using computer vision tools. Um, so when I look at something like this, I first ask, you know, does it pass the smell test, right? Um, can you really look at someone and say that they're more likely to be a terrorist or not? I mean, I call it, it's called racism. You can look at someone and make that assumption, but it's not based in science, it's based on stereotypes. Um, and then in, in addition to that, even if you're able to, for instance, um, IQ, so that the kinds of things like IQ, I mean, I write about this in a book chapter, um, the history of the IQ test and what it's supposed to test for and, and who it was created by is a whole other thing in itself. And so even if you could tell whether someone quote unquote would have a high IQ or not, it's already a problematic way to classify people, if you're, especially if you wanna decide whether to give them an opportunity or not. And so now you're taking that problematic thing already and infusing it into all of these models that are, are gonna be used um, by everybody. Um, oh, and then this example, well, that's interesting. Um, I just, so uh, this example is from Higher View. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a company that, uh, that basically sifts through lots of people's resumes and has an automated way to determine who should be uh, invited for an interview versus not. And then they used to have, so this example is now obsolete because I just received an email from them like a few days ago saying they decided to stop using the uh, automated facial analysis tool. But before they stopped it, what they used to do was they used to have people recorded, um, have a recorded interview, and they uh, would take what they call verbal and nonverbal cues um, of uh, these people's interviews. So what I learned is that they actually used automated um, the emotion detection, and then they would then give um, these quote unquote verbal nonverbal cues to the potential employer. Um, and so when I when I talk about this, there was always, I guess we can't, I don't know if we can do this with um, a thousand attendees, but when I, when I talk about this, there was always multiple people in the audience who have um, experienced um, being recruited by HireVue and they always had very interesting things to share. So I'm actually curious, like if someone has experienced this with HireVue, it'd be so interesting if you could like post on the Q&A so we can hear. Um, I can't, I don't know if I can see, I can't see the Q&A right now. But if someone has posted in the Q&A, it would be really great if, um, oh, why can't I see the q and I don't know why. Um, oh, I can see it. Okay. Um, yeah, if, so you had one, um, Shad had one with JP Morgan um, using HireVue. Is there a way we can have you talk or is that, I'm, I'm, or maybe we could do it at the very end, but I'm really interested to hear about your, um, your, uh, your, uh, experience. Okay, your mic is not working. I don't, I don't know. Okay, maybe at the very end we could do it. I don't know if you can talk um, until the very end, but um, but okay, so I, I, I'd like to discuss at the very end. But anyways, um, there are a number of issues here. Many of many people, for instance, didn't even know that they were, there was emotion detection happening on their face when they were uh, being recorded, etc. And so um, recently, um, Harvey had decided to drop this, which is actually a good, good, um, 
a good thing in my opinion. Another example I think that's very timely is face surveillance. Um, so this is an example from Maryland, um, from uh, Maryland's um, face recognition system. It's one of the most invasive in the nation. Um, and uh, so this example is from the Freddie Gray marches. So I believe in 2016, uh, what happened is that police were trying to match people, protesters with their social media profiles. And um, for those who they found um, outstanding warrants, they would then um, arrest them, right? So um, this was basically a way to um, limit someone's civic engagement. Um, so many times in, in our field, or like at least in my field, when we work on these things, we forget that um, that it's it's we're dealing with a, a deeply social discipline, right? Um, computer vision is in computer science, but it's a deeply social discipline. Even if you look at all of the tasks like pose detection, fate, whatever. I mean, all of the things that are not even related to face activity recognition, etc. It's about people, but we all it's it's but we always forget that we're dealing with people, we wanna abstract it away. So I like this quote by Mimi Onuha that says, every data set involving people implies subjects and objects, those who collect and those who make up the collected. It is imperative to remember that on both sides, we have human beings. So I wanna talk about this for a little bit. Um, one of the few, um, oh, interesting. There's a lot of stuff activity on the chat. Um, one of the few, one of the things I notice in our field is that we're always trying to um, appeal to the more powerful, right? So for instance, when you look at recruiting tools like HireVue, they're always trying to appeal to the potential employer, not the potential employee, because the potential employer is who pays them. When you look at researchers, uh, we write our papers or our grants, we're always trying to appeal to the person who's going to give us resources. That's That might be the grant maker, uh, or, or it might be the reviewers who decide, who are the gatekeepers who decide uh, whether our papers get in or not. One of the few projects that I know of that actually appeals to the people at the margins is called Our Data Bodies. And Our Data Bodies is a project that's led by these women. Um, Tawana Petty is actually um, from Detroit and is very active on issues related to face surveillance. Um, Sita is currently a, a professor at um, the London School of Economics. And um, so, so Sita um, gave this talk that I really like at iClear, uh, which is um, International Conference on Learning and Representation. And I, I really, I was part of this uh, workshop too. And I thought many of the talks at this workshop were really good. So if you're interested in this um, space, I recommend that you, um, sorry, my dog is behind me, um, I watch it. So Sita talks about um, the problem with abstraction, right? As I mentioned, even though we deal with deeply social um, issues, we tend to abstract them out into numbers and data entries. She says the problem with abstraction I've heard computer scientists present their work, their research in relation to real world problems as if computer scientists and their research is not done in the real world. I listened to papers that tended to disappear papers into mathematical equations. Marginalized people are demonized and deprived. What is the point of making data dri dri driven systems fairer if they're going to make institutions colder and more punitive? So um, Sita was actually talking about a conference that I helped start. Uh, which is called the Conference on Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics. Um, I, I mean, I didn't help start it, but I was one of the founding uh, members of the ex executive committee, which is like a board. And what's really interesting about her comment is that this is actually a conference that specifically is an interdisciplinary conference on computing, number one. So it's looking for that interdisciplinary approach. And secondly, it's specifically created to, to work on issues of fairness, accountability, and transparency in computing systems. So she came to this conference and she still saw that there was a lot of abstraction and there was a lot of conversation about making data-driven systems quote unquote fairer without thinking about the overall context. So I wanted to give a, a few examples of this, of this issue that she's talking about. 
That is, what's the point of making data-driven systems fairer if they're going to make institutions colder and more punitive? So I wanted to give an example with my own work, actually, and what happened with it. So this work was um, from 2018 um, with Joy Bulamini. And in this work, what we showed, so the overall work showed that um, automated facial analysis tools had much higher error rates for darker skinned women than lighter skinned men. So, so we characterized the error rates by different um, skin tones and gender, but we saw that the highest, um, discrep the highest discrepancy in error rates was between lighter skinned men and darker skinned women. And so we didn't do this by race because race is a social construct and we wanted to look at some, some characteristics that measured something uh, that you can see um, in, a, in, a, in a photo. I mean, there's a whole other um, you know, discussion about that that I can go into. But for now, so here, um, this specific uh, paper took out parts of our examples that talked about automatic gender recognition tools. These are tools that look at a, a, a photo of a face and they determine whether this face is that of a man or a woman. So this is a binary gender um, classification system. And actually we call it a gender ascription system even because it's ascribing a gender to the face that it sees, a binary gender. So it's already making a lot of different assumptions that gender is um, binary, that it's, it's, it doesn't change across time or cultures and, and a whole other, and that you can just see it from someone's face. Um, many different issues there. So this photo, this um, here you see, you know, the darker and darker the skin tone for women, it almost uh, approaches random chance. So random chance would be a flipping a coin, so it'd be fifty percent. Now, after we uh, wrote this paper, um, so we knew we had a hunch that some of this was because of. Um, data sets because um, initially uh, we, had to uh, we had to construct our own data set to do the study. But before that, we tried to see if we could use publicly available data sets. And we found that they were all overwhelmingly lighter skinned and overwhelmingly male. So we had a hunch that this disparity in error rate was happening because of uh, the available data sets that people were using, scraping the internet, et cetera. So, um, so then after we did we wrote this paper there were many many other papers that showed that the um the the data sets that were used in computer vision were skewed in different ways so here is one one is um coco which is a, a very um well-known data set in in research and so this work out of facebook they talk about the discrepancy between you know the distribution of people in the world versus the distribution that the data sets come from, right? So COCO versus the world population. And here is an, the same paper kind of talks about, um, th that shows how um, different APIs for object recognition um, perform, the, so the, dis the disparities in error rates are really high by geography. So for instance, here is um, in Nepal where the ground troop is so, but it thinks that the APIs think it's like food or something. And then versus the UK, it actually gets it that it's soap. Same with spices um, in the Philippines versus the USA, the um, ground truth, the um, APIs get it more right in the more Western context. Similarly, um, these are other works. Um, this is from, I think, Vicente Ordonez's group that talk about how models can amplify the, the kind of the skews and distribution that you see in training sets. Um, and then here are some other works that show that um, for instance, um, this one is an example of what APIs think is, you know, a bride, right? It's very Western heteronormative notion of what a wedding is. So all of these people are kind of um, classified as being in a wedding or bride, et cetera, except for the last um, people. So this is not unique to AI. Um, this kind of um, skew in data sets um, is something that we saw in the automotive industry when they were trying to test for, for, example, for instance, when they were doing crash tests. So they used that um, dummies that are, were, you know, adults with adult male characteristics. And so people showed that um, uh, car crashes were overwhelmingly killing women and children. Um, clinical trials, the same thing. Um, are, I believe eight out of the 10 drugs that were pulled out of the market in the late 90s or something like that disproportionately affected women because many of these um, drugs 
were not um, tested, uh, they weren't required to test them on women or people of color or, or show their results in a disaggregated way to see how it affects different groups of people. But um, the issue I have is that after this work came out, a lot of people sort of started reducing the problem of fairness or something like that to the distribution and data. Right, so, so the, the conversation sort of stopped at diversify your data set, diversify your data set. And, and that's, that, that's a very narrow view of what the problem is for a number of reasons. So first of all, um, let me give you a few examples. Um, so here is um, the diversity in PACES data. So IBM, what they did after this, um, our work came out is one of the things they did was they decided to come up with um, a data set called diversity and faces data set and um they they said they thought okay like if we make a whole uh data set available for researchers that is diverse um then they can do the kind of experiment that me and joy did at scale so if if some of this um doesn't uh, work on various groups of people you can know now they had to take it down and in fact there is a lawsuit based on this data set because they use Flickr data. And when people upload their pictures on Flickr, they're not thinking that this is going to be used for some sort of, you know, automated facial analysis tool, right? Then when I was at Google last year, they were trying to improve, um, I believe, like the performance of a pixel camera or something like that. And so they wanted to gather um, pictures of darker skinned people, but the way they went about it, it was dubious. Um, they hired a contractor to do it and they were using dubious um, tactics. And here's the headline. Um, then um, people thought, oh, okay, like for gender recognition, um, a lot of people in the trans community are not represented in it. So we should diversify our data sets. And they kind of pulled um, uh, pictures of you, uh, videos of uh, trans YouTubers without their consent. And then finally, um, Microsoft um, kind of came up with this blog post saying that they've now improved um, gender recognition um, systems and the disparities in air rates are no longer what we um, mentioned in our paper. And all of these basically, you know, ignored the very basic question. The basic question is, should there be a gender, automatic gender recognition tool in the first place? And the answer is really no. Um, so if you're interested in why you, there's many um, papers that have been written about the harms automatic gender recognition tools cause, especially to people in the trans community. But then the first question is why, why do we need this kind of tool? What is it generally um, created for? Is it to automatically detect someone's gender and then maybe like in advertisement, tell them you know, what kind of things they should be interested in. So that would be gen you know, perpetuating the gender stereotype. Is it what what is it exactly is it for so when you when you look at the risks and the benefits you, you many times can come to the conclusion that this really isn't something that should exist now. If you're not from the group that is harmed by such technology, then you might never come to that conclusion because you'll never think about why people in this group would be harmed, but if you are then many, many people in the group that's harmed by this technology very quickly come to the conclusion that it shouldn't exist. So at the very least, when I was at Google, we convinced them not to have a general purpose automatic gender recognition tool. So this is an example where reducing the problem to just equalizing error rates across groups is, not, is, is, is really not the right thing to do. There is a fundamental question to always be asked, and that is, what is the technology that we're building and how is it being used? Um, another example of um, this diversifying data sets is in face surveillance. So here's an example where, you know, China has a very extensive face rec um, surveillance system. And because there aren't many black faces in the data set, um, faces of people in, of African descent, there is a push to get more of that. And here's one example here of, of gathering data from Zimbabwe. But one should ask, you know, are Zimbabweans signing up? Are, are they consenting to this gathering of data um, of their faces? How would they benefit if such a system was created? Um, another, um, yeah, so, so 
in terms of face surveillance, right? And I think the conversation has evolved a lot more these days um, because we know that, I mean, a bunch of companies have de decided to stop pursuing it and some companies have, like Amazon, have a moratorium. But when we look at the US, you know, in every country there is a group that is marginalized along some dimension. It's just that that dimension changes um, based on where you are. In the US, the dimension is many uh, people who are black and brown and black and brown communities are overwhelmingly disproportionately negatively affected by face surveillance. It's not like they're, they're not benefiting, benefiting from it. They're disproportionately um, affected by it. And so here's a, the, uh, this is a report called the Perpetual Lineup Report that I always cite from 2016 about the use of um, face surveillance in the US because I learned a lot about it and Joy learned a lot about it too. Um, and so they talk about how one in two American adults is in law enforcement recognition network and they can use this network and database however they want. Um, there, there's no sort of auditing any of these things for accuracy or anything. There's no transparency about how they're using it. Um, and actually, so the interesting thing is when um, this uh, report came out, um, so from the um, Center for Privacy and, and Security and Georgetown Law, they actually were not asking for a moratorium on the technology, they were asking for regulation. And um, they came up with a follow-up report in 2019 um, that more extensively um, studied how they, these systems were being used um, by law enforcement and after, and ICE as well. And after this one, they actually are asking for, they, they asked for a moratorium because um, until like at, at the very least until some strong regulation is passed. Um, so people ask me, you know, um, let me just look at time. Why do I, um, why do I care about face surveillance? You know, because um, it's not like bombs, right? It, it, some technology is very clearly to create, created to destroy something else like a gun or a bomb or something versus face, face recognition. It's not necessarily that way because I can recognize someone's face, you know, people can recognize faces. So why not? Um, why not have face surveillance? So the thing is that what technology does it, is, is it amplifies our intent. So whatever social structure we have right now, it just amplifies it, right? So it's not the technology on its own, it's the technology plus the society that we're living in that, that always should be considered. And I know like people in SDS, science and technology studies have, have been saying this, um, forever, right? So it's a socio-technical system. So here's an example uh, that my colleague Unso Jo pointed me to, she's a historian. And this is an example from World War II in Life Magazine that shows people how to, sep how to distinguish between Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans. So it says, you know, because presumably you want to harass Japanese Americans, but you don't want to harass Chinese Americans. So you want to know how to step, how to distinguish between them. Now, what face surveillance does is it tries to do this kind of thing at scale. And so we know that this is happening in China. Um, we don't have to go to China. We know that this is, uh, you know, this technology is targeting black people in the US. So, um, so uh, and then the other thing to ask is, so who are the people building it? And who are the people that are the recipients of said technology, right? And usually many times there's very little intersection between the people pushing this technology and the people that are um, negatively um, being impacted by it. So one example here is that conference that I told you about, iClear. This is a picture I took. Um, I mean, I mean, this is not a picture I took. This is a picture someone else had that we were horrified when we saw this. So this is before I ever attended iClear. And, you know, I see, you know, these are rooms that we always go to and I don't see anybody else who looks like me or I don't, I barely see any women. I, you know, uh, just all of, all of the things that I, that, that, that we talk about. There's really no sort of diversity, let alone inclusion. And so, why do I bring this up? Because here, um, here's an example of 
someone who kept on going to rooms like this and um, she just wanted to drop out. So this is Deb, Deborah Raji. And um, she told me that before she came to Black and AI, which is a, an organization uh, my colleague Reddy Tapab and I um, co-founded, Deb said that before coming to Black and AI, she was ready to quit the tech industry as a whole uh, because she was going into rooms like this. Uh, she was doubly facing racism and sexism. When you're a Black woman, you face both of those um, things and you, you face it even from people in your own community, the sexism. So she was so sick of this, right? And she almost dropped out and uh, uh, I invited her. I didn't know this when I invited her um, to join because I saw her and I tracked her down. She has won you know, the 2020 EFF Electronic Frontiers Foundation Pioneer Award for, for this work that, that she did. And so this work was showing that Amazon's recognition tool had could have similar biases to the ones that uh, we showed in gender shades. So, so that means so that it might have you know issues and that they shouldn't be selling it to police right now. The moment this paper came out, VP after VP at Amazon was attacking Deb and uh, Joy. Uh, Deb was an undergrad at the time. Joy was a PhD student, and VP after VP was attacking these two black women. Not nobody at their institution stood up for them. Nobody else stood up for them. And they were terrified and stressed out after um, Amazon's VPs came out attacking them. Um, and what we had to do, um, what we had to do, sorry, was um, basically my colleague Meg Mitchell and I spent a whole month coming up with a point by point rebuttal because they were trying to attack the technical integrity of the work. And we assembled um, people in the computer vision community mostly and other scientists and we wrote an open letter. Um, and um, people like, you know, a lot of people signed it like Joshua was, um, he had won the Turing award at the time, et cetera. And so we came to the, um, like 70 something people find, um, signed it and we came to, to their defense. Um, and so what am I trying to say? It's, it's not just about writing papers, right? It's also about, um, you know, there are very few people who actually put their career on the line. And the people who do that are usually the ones from the communities who are ne most negatively impacted by this stuff. Um, a lot of other people wouldn't do that. Um, and as we know, I mean, I guess this is actually from Michigan, right? Um, there was, there was I, I, I guess they say the first case of a black man um, or any person being wrongfully accused of a crime because of faulty face recognition system, right? Can you imagine this happened just now, um, re just recently, right? And um, how, you know, and, and thankfully there are laws that were passed in a bunch of other cities, right? But not in Detroit. And um, Tuana Petty actually um, from our data bodies and um, Data for Back Lives um, has been working day and night to not only educate communities about face surveillance, but have some sort of um, so, some sort of action against it. Um, so, what? Um, <laughs> so it's not about writing just writing papers, like I said. Um, and what happens um, when you don't just write papers and you you try to you you focus on impact is you um, have to be. You know, in many of these public discussions, you have to push some uh, stuff forward. You have to come to people's defense. You have to um, try, try to go for impact. What happens when you do that is you get labeled. Most recently, I've been labeled a deranged activist uh, by some people <laughs> in the field. Um, and my um, colleague, Al Mahdi, he's a theoretical computer scientist. He talked about how there's the Carl Sagan effect um, I didn't know about the Carl Sagan effect when uh, you know you're engaging in public discussion, you're perceived as less productive. Um, and um, he talks about how people try to separate out activists from scientists. And he's from Morocco, and um, he com he co he uh, was kind of comparing it to when authoritarian regimes want to um, they want to kind of target certain journalists. And so instead of calling them journalists, they start calling them activists rather than journalists because that makes it much easier to target them because they start telling stories about them. 
And this has happened with me a lot, like many, many times. I, even when I give a talk like this at some point, and many times, you know, it would be interspersed with some of my uh, other work. Um, I would have conversations with some professors who are like, you were weaving in and out of science and activism. Um, and I wanna say, you know, there's no such thing as neutral science. It's, it's, it's all, you know, this is uh, something that is always, um, uh, I would say, critiqued by queer, theor queer feminist um, uh, studies, et cetera, um, Black feminist studies, et cetera. The view, the view they call it the view from nowhere because all views are from somewhere. It's from some person's point of view. And when we teach science as if it's this objective reality that's not from anybody's point of view, um, that's critiqued as the view from nowhere. And actually, I think that assumption is, um, in my opinion, at the root of many of the issues we're dealing today. Um, for instance, um, in trying to work on ethics, there's many things that are happening in Silicon Valley, like they have these ethics boards, they have these institutes, etc. But um, the view from nowhere probably makes them think that anybody could be on these ethics boards and anybody could be on these institutes. And you can kind of come up with a process that makes sure that ensures that technology is not harming uh, people in the most marginalized group. But that's not true because you're only going to see the potential harms from your perspective not from the perspective of the people who are most marginalized. So you're not going to actually work on technology that stop, mitigates the harm of people who are most marginalized. Um, this is an example, uh, this is a similar example where uh, some people call it parachute research, right? Where people, um, this happens a lot in international studies, but it's happening a lot in fairness too, where the people who are being most marginalized, and this happens a lot with um, anything related to Africa as well. People outside, study Africa, do something about Africa, but not collaborating with the African scientists or not at all taking um, input of the people who are in their own communities doing stuff. Um, and so this is um, from, actually, this is an example from, I believe, um, uh, personalized medicine, uh, where uh, one of the researchers is kind of frustrated by it because, for instance, um, I believe only 1% or less of DNAs in, in these DNA studies is taken from people of African descent. So what does it mean for next level drugs and other personalized studies um, that are happening? But what can happen when we're thinking about, you know, technology from the perspective of people most harmed? We can flip it, right? We can work on things that don't just do like, it's not like trickle down, you know, technology where it first, um, benefits uh, people in certain groups, and then maybe it'll trickle down. So some of my favorite examples of this are, one is um, Sharon Zhao. So you remember we talked about how police were um, trying to look at people's faces and link them to social media profiles. Well, Sharon decided that she'll create, a, a, what is it called? Um, just like an interface where you can put your picture through her interface and it'll cover people's faces before you post it on uh, online. This is my favorite, one of my favorite examples of just using face detection. I mean, so it's face detection, not recognition, right? So it's just detect detecting where there are faces rather than recognizing them. Um, I, this is a Logic uh, Magazine interview with Tuana Petty. So since you're all in Michigan, I highly recommend it. Um, she talks about face, um, face um, surveillance. Um, and this is some fun stuff about like, people coming up with fashion to full face recognition systems. Um, yes, there's, um, well, somebody talked about adversarial learning. So there's um, some interesting work on adversarial learning at CMU where they're like um, even, you know, can um, 3D print glasses that full um, face recognition systems. And they're, inter they're like trying to see how, how to attack, um, how they can attack some of these systems. Very interesting work. Um, this is some example from my work where um, my student Rasa Ja, who's in, um, who grew up in a township in South Africa and I are trying to use um, satellite imagery to uh, quantify spatial, uh, the effects of spatial apartheid in South, South Africa. So I think you can kind of see what it means, what spatial apartheid means, is segregation, but it, in, in the 1954 uh, apartheid act um, mandated that people can only live in certain um, neighborhoods. So this is just, this is after apartheid was supposed to have ended, but you can very clearly see 
the, um, the segregation um, here. Um, and so this is some work that we're doing. And um, another uh, work that uh, we did with my collaborator was to um, try to identify um, cassava leaf, um, disease uh, leaves. Um, so cassava is um, a, a crop that's eaten by you know, more than 80% of uh, people in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And finally, um, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart because I'm originally uh, from Ethiopia. I'm of um, Eritrean descent. So currently there is, before I got fired from Google, the only thing that was consuming me was this war that's going on in Northern Ethiopia um, in the Tigray region. And even though um, the governor is not allowing any journalists to go in, um, right now there is no humanitarian corridor. There are some people doing data journalism they're looking at, so they found that by looking at satellite images that certain um, refugee camps were targeted, um, certain food storage facilities for their refugee camps were targeted. So, you know, I think some of these examples of data journalism, some of these other examples are good examples to show that we can perhaps start to think about, you know, technology that um, works in the benefit of the most marginalized. Um, and with that, I'm done and happy to take questions. Timnit, thank you so much for such an inspiring talk. You've really got a lot of people talking. I've been following the chat while you were speaking. <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of questions in Q&A. And um, if you have access to the Q&A button. Yeah. Um, it might just be easier if you choose whichever ones you feel like addressing. Um, so somebody says, could it be possible to program the algorithm to classify certain groups in a negative way, regardless of whether that classification holds true or not? Um, yeah, I mean, people can do this however they want. And um, I think, I guess the short answer here is yes. <laughs> I don't think, I'm, you know, it could be that there's many ways this can happen. Um, for instance, so I can give you one example where you might think that it's true. Um, so I got to be careful because I can answer each of these questions for like 10 minutes. So I want to get through as many as I can. So this example is predictive policing. So in predictive policing, um, what they do is they, uh, so thankfully, because of some of the work of some of my colleagues like uh, William Isaac and Christiane Lum, and a lot of work from uh, Stop LAPD Spying and others, um, LAPD stopped using um, Predpol, which is um, predictive policing tool, right? What this tool does is it tries to tell them, they use it to try to figure out where the crime hotspots would be, right? So in this, um, it, what William and Christiane showed in their paper is that, um, for instance, uh, when you look at drug use in Oakland, it's very evenly distributed, very evenly distributed. But when you look at what, what the drug, uh, the arrests for drug use, they're not evenly distributed. There are specific locations um, that are considered uh, that, that, that they, they arrest and it's mostly black and brown communities. Now, what is the data that they use in order to train predictive policing algorithms? It's not who commits a crime, it's who has been arrested for that crime. So then they, they train a model based on who's been arrested for the crime. We already know there's lots of data that shows which groups of people are more heavily policed. So you're already having a data set that, that, that is not reflecting reality. Then they send more police to these neighborhoods, right? That, and then because they send more police, you're gonna arrest more people. I mean, if you're gonna send more police, you're gonna arrest more people. That feeds in your, into your uh, training data and they have what, what, what's called a, a, a runway feedback loop, right? So this is an example where even if people think they're, you know, quote unquote neutral and they're just trying to figure it out, whatever, they're obviously perpetuating um, social inequities um, a one by one. So this is just one example I wanted to give. Um, okay. Is this Michael Lissick from Twitter? Or is this a different Michael Lissick? Because, okay, 
I'm just having PTSD right now because there is a Michael Lissick on Twitter who's been harassing me incessantly. So I'm hoping that's not you. I'm so sorry if I'm mistaken, if it's a different person, but I just, I just had like a whole, I'm like, how did this person get it? But I'm sorry. So why would anyone believe that the face is relevant? I don't know. I don't know who would actually pay for it. I don't know. You and me, you and me, uh, you and me both, Michael, I have no idea. Um, so, I mean, if people feel like he, this is why the, the rhetoric around what quote unquote AI or data system driven systems can do versus they cannot do is really important because if, if there is a lot of hype, people can believe, you know, automated systems. So there's this, um, what we call, um, what's the word? Automation bias, right? A lot of people can just believe that um, data driven systems or automated tools just work like magic and they, they, they're infallible. And here, um, people are not, uh, you know, they're not even applying their critical um, thinking skills, right? So there's an example where, um, even in, in cases like robotics, there's an example where a a Anna Howard at um, Georgia Tech and her students did this example where they showed that um, uh, there was a simulated fire and people were just, and there's a robot trying to like guide people and people were just following this robot anywhere without like even if it didn't make sense where they were where the robot was taking them so it could be that people just assume oh because it's an automated system that it'll work but um but you and me both you know i don't i don't really know but there are these startups that purport to sell these services to the government and to um corporations and sorry i freaked out after seeing your name michael i'm telling you there's a a namesake that's uh been kind of really scaring me uh, online. Um, okay, and uh, Leah asks, hope to hear your views on how proven racial bias encoding impacts this area. Well, I mean, uh, it's basically, you know, so one example is- The nicest introduction ever. Oh, sorry, I just heard something. So there's many examples of this. One recent one is, so there's an example of, for instance, GPT-3 um, generating text that's hor horrible in terms of towards Muslims, right? And so I was just reading a one, a one zero article, Medium article, and, and, and they say in this article, you know, sure, there's the, there's the, um, there's the data set um, that they use, and then there's the decision that this is okay to productize. Right. First of all, if it were me, there is no way I would use Reddit data to train any of these things because I, as a black woman, have experienced Reddit and I don't even go there even to look up things that I'm interested in because I know what how toxic that environment is for people like me. So I would never even use that data to train anything. So here is that decision that it, to, to use that data that's already, you know, based on your background and experience. And then there's the decision of what you think is okay to, to, to put out there versus not, right? So these are just some examples I have, but there's so many, I mean, there is so many. Um, I actually wrote a, a book chapter on race and gender on um, Oxford's handbook of AI ethics that talks a lot about this, um, about, you know, like who is at the table and driving is, is a big uh, basically determiner of, determinant of what kind of technology um, we're putting out there. Um, did higher view explain why they decided to curtail the facial announcements? Yes, I mean, they had a whole report, which I haven't had the time to read, but um, I think what they said, what they said was they, they found that it didn't um, provide much more um, information, I think, is what they answered, what they said, but I don't know if that's the real reason. Um, I think the real reason might be that there was a lot of outcry about um, about that particular portion of um, what they had. Oh, Alex, can we have can we have Alex talk? Alex, if, if Alex Bismuth is here, I don't know if, <laughs> about um, the interview that they had uh, with the um, higher view? I don't know. 
I'm searching um, to see if Alex is still in the session. Um, okay. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna move on to the next question. Yeah, Why looks, is it looks like they're not? But people okay. we can unmute people and have them and have them speak if if anyone has anything particular. Okay, so then there's this question, why is emotion detection a problem? Are the results faulty? First, the results are faulty. Second, um, it, you know, it's a huge privacy. Like when I am, so when I am, um, imagine if I'm doing an interview and in addition to all of the things I'm trying to say, not say, this thing constantly classifies me as angry. And then that's the reason, one of the reasons I don't get a job. Um, and so that's one, like uh, I, we don't even know how well these things work and, um, and, and they're being used for, for this kind of high stakes scenarios. In general, I'm not a proponent of trying to infer internal state. So there, it's one thing to say, okay, from my face, you might be able to tell whether I'm smiling or not. But what, like, if you're gonna tell me that you can tell whether I'm happy or not, I just, you know, first of all, I'm not going to believe you, even though, I mean, there was even a radio lab um, episode where someone said this kind of stuff. So, and then, um, and then let's say you say your um, algorithm is really accurate and that you can tell me that I'm happy and I'm telling you that I'm not happy. And then because of automation bias, people will believe your algorithm instead. I think this is very dicey. Second, thirdly, our emotions are some of the most private things we hold, right? So if this technology was actually accurate, even in certain ways, what, what are the privacy implications of just being able to deploy it um, or, or use it however you please? Um, so that's, that's, those are my thoughts on emotion detection. Um, okay, what's your response to the controversy over virtually proctored exams that use computer vision to do things like see when students are looking away, especially with everything going on? Oh, um, I, I guess I don't know. I don't know very much about this controversy, so it's it's kind of harder for me to say. Um, yeah, so I'm I don't know exactly what happened here. Um, and if you can, uh, if uh, is it Oluwakim, Victoria Johnson? I don't know if they're here, but if they can um, elaborate more, maybe I can I can answer more. But I'm not exact. I don't I don't really know what this controversy is. Um, hmm. Recently, face surveillance technologies were used to identify perpetrators of the capital insurgency. How do you feel about this usage? This is a very interesting question. Um, I still feel uneasy about it because um, in, in the long run, um, you know, I, 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 still, I still feel uneasy about basically the, te the technology, like the same thing I said about how um, uh, it was used to curtail people's civic liberties, although I don't believe this was obviously, you know, curtail civil liberties. But if they had the same kinds of um, issues in terms of recognizing people, if they had the same kinds of issues where they were like, you know, trying to match them um, the way I talked about before, I still feel, um, uneasy about it. And I think it's hard because it's hard to, um, when we're advocating for something to pick and choose. Um, and when it's, you know, kind of a cause we believe in, we're like, okay, yeah, you can use the technology for this, but when it's something we don't believe in, then you can't. So I think that th this technology still has so many issues to be flushed out and we still don't have enough regulation to make sure that it's being used um, responsibly um, that I would still um, feel uneasy about it, um, <laughs> even though the actual insurgency was, yeah, I, I don't even know what to say about that. Uh, um, it looks like uh, Alu Akimi is still in the, in the okay, chat. Yeah. They've, they've got their hand raised. So if, um, okay, maybe, um, yeah, I guess that would be the last question, maybe that okay. we answer then. For sure. Um, Alu Akimi, I'm going to allow you to talk here so you can kind of elaborate on this one. All thank right, you. you're able to unmute. Yep, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So a couple articles about like proctoring using comp computer vision algorithms mentioned the things that you talked to, like looking at like if they're smiling, if their eyes are looking away, and then there, it's a private company that some universities hire to proctor their exams. And then students have risen concerns because especially students of color and yeah. being a dark-skinned woman, they have done things like putting 
a lamp right in front of their face to make sure that the computer vision algorithm has has seen their face accurately. But then people on the university side has said like they this exam is very important and still needs to be proctored. So I just wanted to know your response in two sides. Yeah. So I, you know, my gut, so hearing what you just said, my initial reaction is we know about this school to prison pipeline in terms of um, black black kids um, and how they're treated um, versus non-black kids, black and brown kids and how they're treated versus everybody else. And we know examples of how face surveillance was being put in, in, into the school, physical schools. Um, so I, I think it's, I don't agree with it at all. And there's also the instance of, like I said, um, before something like this is used, it has to be, there has to be some, right now we have no standards, no way, no transparency, no way to see how accurate is this thing even? What if it's gonna um, automatically say that all black people, all of the black students are cheating, which happens a lot in schools. My, my little cousin was accused of cheating because she, the teacher said she couldn't have written an essay that good. This is, I don't know how many experiences people have, but this is something we've all dealt with over and over in school. And so now we're gonna reinforce that type of treatment using using these models. And so I feel very uneasy about it. I feel like, first of all, I don't even know if something like that should ever be deployed, but if, before something like that is ever deployed, there should be some sort of process, some sort of debate, some sort of standardization procedure that goes on. It's horrible. Yeah, sorry. It's just, if it, it yeah, that, that, that's kind of, oh, and then you said, you said they had to put a, a light on their faces. This reminds me of, so Simone Brown has a book called um, Dark Matters. It talks about the history of surveillance in the US. And one of the things she talks about is the fact that there was a, a law called the Lantern Law in New York. And um, people who are black, mixed and indigenous had to have a lantern with them when they walked around at night in the evening. So this is a form of surveillance, right? So. Um, her point in the book was that um, that whatever type of um, you know technology you have, um, it, it can always be used to subjugate uh, those who are already subjugated. So even if it's just a lantern, you can use the lantern to create the lantern law, right? And now we can be using more sophisticated things, but the intent doesn't change. Um, I'm not, I mean, there's a lot of questions I haven't answered, but um, yeah, I guess. Um, I Can mean, I should I answer one more or? You're, <laughs> you, 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 you know, this is, this is just such, you've uh, brought up so many emotions and there's so much excitement and energy, but you've really given a lot and you shouldn't feel compelled to stay longer than you want to. To the extent you want to, we'd love to have you answer more questions. We still have several hundred people here. Okay, so let's maybe let's say let's go until like 5.15 or so. Um, okay, so let me go. Um, okay. Um, and then there's an anonymous attendee that says, recently face surveillance technology were used. Uh, yeah, I, I just answered that sort of answer didn't really answer but I, I still I still have to think through how exactly I feel about that but my current I think people had written like Meredith Whitaker and others but my current thinking is I I don't think it's it's, it's you know we should we should agree on something we should have laws and we should apply all of those you know because it's 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 a dicey thing so one um one example that uh, I think Z Z Z Zainab Trafucci was saying this. So at some point, I think there was um, the TikTok. I don't remember what it was. Yeah, it was like a Trump rally and uh, people kind of flooded TikTok um, to, it was sort of like a DDoS attack. I don't remember um, exactly the, the circumstances and, and many people were celebrating. But Zainab was saying, 
don't celebrate because that exact same tactic can be used to do something else in the future um, that you're just not gonna be celebrating about, right? So this thing about using, um, using a face surveillance to identify perpetrators, that's how I'm feeling about. But I mean, I can't even uh, believe that, that we're in a time where that just happened. So that's a whole different <laughs> thing. Um, okay, contact details. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, you can email my Gmail, but I, uh, I have to warn you that I'm extremely behind on any, any, any electronic communication. I'm extremely behind right now. Um, um, what's the reason? Uh, well, many, uh, what's the reason for the high error rate for darker skin people? Well, um, in that particular case, we had a hunch that it was um, the training data that was used, um, but, uh, and, and I think the improved, improved results that they had were after they augmented the training data, which is why a lot of people were then fixated on um, diversifying the training data. Okay, assuming one day we could eventually reach fairness in our data and training, would you say it is still controversial to have models detect things like potential criminals, inclination to use violence, etc.? I just, I don't think I will ever agree with potential criminals, inclination to use violence. I don't think I will ever agree with that because history tells us that these labels are usually put by people in privilege um, against people not in, pr in privilege. And, and like, you know, I mean, for instance, all black people were considered potential violent, you know? I mean, and it's just, there's so many examples of this. Um, in, my, in my chapter on race and gender, I write about Charles Darwin and how, how he, actually one thing I talk about is how data-driven systems are usually used to perpetuate uh, the, 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 the well, some of the most terrible norms of the day. So when you look at Charles Darwin, he tries to justify why women are not as smart as men uh, by looking at this, he, he writes in The Descent of Man, he's like, oh, when you look at the brain of women, um, it's like the size of a child or whatever versus the brain of an adult man. And so he tries to justify it, right? And, and Fast forward to today, the same stuff is happening um, without questioning the underlying premise of like, for instance, um, IQ tests, what are they, what are exactly our, our IQ test testing? Since when are they a measure of quote unquote intelligence? So without even asking the question of whether an, what an IQ test tests and whether we should use it for anything, then people start doing studies of, oh yeah, like, you know, men happen to be at the extremes and women happen to be whatever, you know, they use data-driven systems to try to justify things. So I'm, I can't imagine a day, well, I'll be okay with trying to predict, like I said, someone's quote unquote internal state like that, like potential to be violent or potential to, to do this. I just, um, an exception might be, might, and I still have to think about this, might be if, um, you know, if you're, if, if it's something very well known, like if you've had a terrible life or if you've had a terrible environment, like people say, people who grew up in an abusive household might, you know, uh, might be more likely to be abusive or something like that. If you wanna use that information to then do an intervention, like help people who grew up in an abusive household, that's one thing. But many times that's not what these things are used for. So my gut feeling is just, I'm not, why, why? I don't, I don't know uh, why we would do that. And secondly, I don't think we will ever reach quote fairness in our data and tra training. That just can't, I can't imagine what that means because again, what's fair is context dependent, people, culture, just everything dependent that I can't imagine a universal sort of you know, fairness, um, even though I know there's a lot of mathematical definitions of fairness going on. Um, so yeah, so I think that is, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Okay, so Victor asks, is there any uh, bibliography for the sources prevent presented in this discussion or will the slide deck be made available? Um, so actually a, a, a modified version of the slide tech is available. If you go to Fate CV, 
I think it's fatecv.com, but it's a fate CV um, tutorial uh, at CVPR. And so it's a three part tutorial. Um, part one is mostly this talk that I just gave with a few slides that are different. Um, part two is about just data ethics in general. And part three is about like um, some frameworks um, that we recommend. And so if you're interested in that, if you go to fatecv.com or is it dot, I think it's, if you if you look for the Fate CV tutorial at CVPR, um, you'll, you'll find the slides and they're mostly, um, yeah, they're mostly the same. Um, to me, this is a question of politics, which is how society is organized, the relationships of power and inequalities, not parties. How much is what we have become scared or scared off by online corporations? Yeah, um, it really is a matter of, I, I, I think right now, just like, um, I don't know if it's a matter of um, online corporations, but I think I, I have another talk called the hierarchy of knowledge where I talk more about this, but like, I think the way we teach, uh, we learn about science and the way we teach or math or whatever, and technology uh, and the way we teach people about it, it's that it's like completely divorced from politics. And that's just not true. It's, it's, all, it's all, you know, based on what we think is important, what, wh how we view the world, what's good, what's not good. You know, it's, it's just, it's all based on that. And you can trace things um, when, you, when you, like I have, I have examples in my other talk about this. So, so I think that um, in standpoint theory, at least people try to, a lot of people write, you know, I'm doing this analysis from a standpoint of this type of person who went through this, who did that, whatever, because that's just understanding that your standpoint affects your analysis. And I, um, and one of the things I really would call for in science and technology education is a more explicit like um, acknowledgement of that and, and to, to teach students to understand that more rather than move away from that, which is I think my whole life when we're learning about science and technology um, that's kind of how we've um, been taught to think about um, science and technology. So I have another talk where like that's kind of the whole thing, <laughs> the whole talk is um, about that. Um, okay, I'm gonna answer one more question and I think we can call it a night after that. So Tiana says, I really appreciate your research and all that you do. Do you have book recommendations for those of us who want to focus on ethical AI and this type of inter? <laughs> oh, okay. so. Let me um, try, okay, so maybe I, um, if I type an answer, does everybody see it or, or yeah. is it just the, quest, the person? Okay, so I have a lot of um, recommendations. I have uh, Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin. I have um, uh, Dark Matters, like I said, by Simone Brown. Um, I have, um, I think, or is it, yeah, I have um, Algorithms of oppression, artificial unintelligence. Um, what else? Um, there is um, there is a bunch more, but those are some of the ones. In my other talk, I have like a whole uh, book, and um, I think, yeah, I think so. Artificial, yeah, I think those are four or five books, and I actually recommend that you watch um, Ruha Benjamin's keynote at iClear 2020. It's a 40 minute keynote. And in her keynote and in her Q and A, she gives a lot of other references, like for each point that she makes, she gives a, a book reference or some other reference. So I, I highly recommend that you do that. I, I thought it was a very good keynote and an informative one. Okay, I think, I think that's it for me. Sorry, I didn't get to all the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timnit. This is just absolutely amazing. And uh, you've, you've, this is a really- Oh, Mar Hicks, talk. sorry. Yes, Mar Hicks Programmed Inequality. That's a great book. Sorry. <laughs> yes. I, see, I saw it on the chat, but yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for engaging. Um, so- tightly with all of us and uh, for inspiring so many of us. And best of luck in your quest. Thank you for having me. 
and um, thanks to everybody who attended and was uh, extremely engaged and engaging. Yeah, and hope to see everybody next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.